media. How much does the media shape the way we think? How responsible are news outlets in educating the public about the absolute disaster we are sleepwalking into? In this episode of Tipping Points, I speak with two seasoned journalists about what drove them to become activists. I have with me Zoe Blackler, an investigative journalist who published for many news outlets, including The Guardian and The New York Times, and for radio documentaries for the BBC. She's now the coordinator of the whistleblowing platform Truth Teller and has recently become involved with court cases involving XR activists. We also have Steve Toos, who works as a tabloid journalist for 20 years. And after having left the industry, he's used his skills to produce a one off issue of the newspaper called Not the Sun that's aimed to be both funny and truthful. More such projects may be in the pipeline. Welcome to you both. Hi. Thank you. Thanks. Starting with you, Zoe, when did you first learn about the climate and ecological emergency and uh, when did that first enter your consciousness? Um, Funnily enough I was clearing out the loft the other day and I found a whole bunch of undergraduate essays about tackling the climate crisis. I think even at school I remember seeing an image of a greenhouse and being taught about the greenhouse effect Uh, and in this essay it started off saying this is an existential threat for the human race. And it was a discussion about how our international organisations could cope with it. And I went to Rio for the first Earth Summit. And then something happened. I guess my life just took off and I did other things. And I assumed that it was being dealt with. I assumed that the people in charge would be doing something about it. In the few years before Extinction Rebellion, I was looking around more at doing stories around the environment and around climate and applying for jobs at Global Witness, that kind of stuff. I had this growing awareness that there was a problem, but it wasn't really until I was at a party at the end of 2018 and I met someone, a friend of a friend, and he was covered in exile patches and he'd just been at an action. It might've even been the Three Bridges. And he said to me, this thing, Extinction Rebellion, it's really important, look it up. And the next day I Googled Extinction Rebellion and I watched the Heading for Extinction talk, the original one that Gail did. Something made absolute sense to me. I think it was the realisation that the predictions were so far behind the reality and even the predictions were astonishingly shocking and horrifying. And then the added inspiration that you could do something about it. And then I think in the three years since then, through doing the work with Extinction Rebellion, what started off perhaps as an intellectual understanding has landed as an emotional understanding. Steve, how about you? When did you first become aware of the scale and urgency of the situation? I think I actually noticed it in the early 1990s, but in a weird kind of tabloidy way. I was working for a big press agency based in Bristol, who were a kind of feeder agency to all the red tops, all the tabloid newspapers. And I was a kind of chief reporter there and I was doing really well and couldn't wait to get to Fleet Street. It must have been about around about the Rio time. Suddenly everything green became a craze for the tabloids, but they couldn't buy enough green stories off us. Green this and green that and recycling and all the ways the world was going to change. And, you know, and it was all about lifestyle change. And then I can remember really clearly having a call with somebody on the Sun News desk them going, yeah, we've had enough green now. We're fed up with green. Green's boring now. Oh, these green fanatics, you know, that we've gone to recycling. We've got renewables. The government are doing things now. What, what are they going on about? And that was when I first started to have this kind of cognitive dissonance thing. I was having it anyway with working on the tabloids because I was always a bit of an environmentalist. I was a lefty. I was a Labour Party member. I was working for the Heart of Darkness, you know. I shelved it, I guess, and I did go up to London. I did work with papers, and I watched it become more and more of a backstage thing. And also I watched the tide turn on it. At the same time, because it had piqued my interest, I was reading lots of books. Mark Linus's book, Six Degrees. And I thought, well, this is talking about the end of the world. And the people I'm working for are treating it like it's a story that's nowhere near as important as what kind of boxer shorts Prince Harry's wearing today. I became more and more kind of scared and worried about it. And if you try to bring these stories up, nobody cares about green stuff anymore. It became a private thing that I was interested in that I worried about. And by the late noughties, my kids were about nine and seven by then, I guess. I had reached that stage where I was reading all this 
terrifying stuff coming out of these scientific institutions and from the IPCC and seeing nothing still in any of the newspapers or magazines that I wrote for, sitting at the table and watching my kids bright-eyed and bushy-tailed planning their futures and where they were going to live and where they go to university. And actually having to reach that kind of slightly cliche point where I'd have to go in the other room and have a cry about it. I thought, mm, you haven't got a future here, guys, and nobody's doing anything about it. And a bit like Zoe was saying, I was kind of waiting for the government to do something. I assume that I did that classic thing. I think people must be, they must be doing, there's something in the background going on. You know, like in the Hollywood disaster movie, the scientists will all step forward and go, da-da, we've got the cure. It's all going to be fine now. And nobody did the da-da moment. And they didn't, and they didn't, and they didn't. I then reached the next kind of stage, which was I started making survivalist plans. I started looking at bits of land in Scotland or, you know, the Hebrides or something, thinking I'd buy this. Is it defendable? Would I, you know, have a stockpile food there? Is somewhere the kids and I can retreat to if it all goes horribly wrong? I started doing, you know, axe sharpening courses and permaculture courses and all that kind of stuff. And thinking that this is what this is what it's going to have to be, because clearly nobody else is worried about this. It's just me. I'd got out of journalism and I was cycling to work one day. I cycled into a bridge block over the Thames, a load of Extinction Rebellion people with banners blocking the road. And I thought, oh, who are these guys? And I jumped off my bike and I locked it up and I helped them hold the banner. And they were great and they were lovely. And it's kind of like it was rebellion meets party time. There was somebody with a boombox there and people dancing around. And lots of angry motorists, but also people coming over to kind of talk to them. And I thought, these guys have got something. It was a bit of a peak in a trough then because there was a heading for Extinction Talk in a pub near me. And I thought, okay, I've seen these guys. I'll go and see it. The guy who gave the heading for Extinction Talk was crazy. He spent about five minutes on the science, and then he spent about 20 minutes putting up slides showing different police cells that he'd been in and which one had been the comfiest to convince us that it was okay to get arrested. And I just thought, this guy's a lunatic. And I went away and I thought, mm, I made a mistake here. I don't think these guys are going anywhere at all. I got together with a couple of people. We set up a meeting in a cafe, a couple of women who were well known in Extinction Project, and me and two other people in this place in Brixton. And then the next thing I knew, we were blocking roads at Marble Arch and the whole thing took off. You know, there'd been highs and lows, but I feel a sense of perhaps foolish optimism and hope. It was only when I started to become involved with Extinction Rebellion and then I started to re-engage with what, what are the newspapers saying about us? What are they saying about Extinction Rebellion? That it reignited my memory of what it was like inside one of those newsrooms and what the pressures and the agendas would have been. There are a lot of people in the Extinction Rebellion who've worked in media, but not actually in newspapers. I felt a really strong sense of needing to be the voice of having been there in any rooms where media was being discussed because there was a level of naivety about these newspapers, a belief that somehow individual journalists could be influenced and to reshape the direction of travel of their newspapers, particularly on the tabloids. And I felt like I had to be the kind of doom laden Cassandra in the room going, mate, these people haven't got a hope in hell of getting the sort of stories you want to get in their newspapers if, if they want a career or indeed a job. I do see it now with young journalists that I talk to, this sense of being conflicted. And there was a situation recently where somebody who's been involved with us was actually involved in reporting on us. And I could see that it was making them feel incredibly uncomfortable. And I think it must be really dispiriting for young journalists to be in that situation of having to follow the editorial line. And I've noticed how the attitude has changed over the three years in terms of the way that journalists, the kind of conversations that I have with them, much more collaborative now than it used to. It used to feel more like we were being interrogated, whereas now it feels more like they want to do whatever they can <laughs> to get the issues out. They understand much more that we're trying to help them. It feels much more like there's a sort of secret handshake going on when you have those conversations, particularly with the young journalists. What makes one person's news is not what makes someone else's news. Tabloids and broadsheets and TV and social media news, all of them have a different definition of what qualifies as news. So when you were making articles for The Guardian and The New York Times, what qualified as news then and has that changed since? The way that The Guardian is reporting on climate now has changed. They've shifted their focus in some way. But I think the overarching structure of how people think about news hasn't. 
And I think that's really problematic. And not just the way that news is being gathered, reported on, thought about. I don't think anybody talks about objective news anymore, but there's still some sense that there's a news agenda that needs to be followed. When you talk to people who don't really understand the full depth of the crisis and what needs to happen, they say, oh, well, it's a very difficult thing to report on because we need particular events. I even had a conversation with a journalist. She was saying, oh, I, I'd love to do a piece on one of your trials, but um, it's all everything's really busy at the moment with all the parties in Downing Street. And I said, well, you know, it is the end of the world. And she said, well, the end of the world's been going on for quite a long time now. <laughs> and it's this idea that that there is a natural law to how news is reported, what makes news, what the priorities should be. And all you have to do is look at what happened before COP to see what total nonsense that is. Because before COP, they were actively shining a spotlight onto areas that might contribute to some interesting reporting in the run up to COP. And then as soon as COP ends, it's like the crisis isn't happening anymore. It would be perfectly possible for the Today programme to have an item on every day where they scrutinise what the government is doing in terms of net zero strategy. They could, every time they have a minister on, they could be saying, and what are you doing about getting to net zero and decarbonizing the economy? They could be having experts on having a discussion about, is 2050 soon enough? There's so much that they could be doing if they chose to focus their attention on that. And yet you hear trivial, ridiculous items. But I also think that even within the rules of the game, as they're currently played, there is plenty of scope for journalists and mainstream news outlets, and particularly the Today programme and other programmes like that that are hugely influential in terms of setting the agenda, they could be doing so much more. And it's, and it's deeply disappointing. My daily news fodder comes from the BBC, even though most of the time I just want to throw my radio out the window. They are in a terrible situation because they're having their own existential crisis. They've got to be careful about how critical they can be of the government. Is climate just not suited for the news? And we, we know that uh, many editors and journalists say that the story is too slow moving, too complicated, too abstract. Is that right? <laughs> um, no, absolutely not. It's happening now. Even if your definition of news is to report on events, there are plenty of events that are happening now worthy of attention. There are extreme weather events happening all around the world. There are extreme weather events and impacts that are happening in this country. We could be making the connection with climate with those. I think that's an excuse. I think it's worse than an excuse, actually. I think it's a cover-up for the fact that they are deliberately not doing it. It's, it's, it's more than just they can't see a story in it, it's that they refuse to see a story in it. There is a party line in an office, certainly on a tabloid and a, on a place like the Daily Mail, where there is a worldview and stories that don't support that worldview are not acceptable news agenda fodder, you know, because it requires them to then start putting forward a worldview that's about change. The owners of those newspapers do not want change. They are making money from the situation as it stands. So the job of those newspapers and the people who are chosen to run those newspapers is to keep business as usual going. One of the main reasons that Brexit happened is because of the drip, drip, drip of anti-EU narrative that went out through those newspapers for year after year after year. So imagine if they decided that they would take that approach with the climate they could actually turn things around. And they're aware that they could actually turn things around, but it's not in, their in the interests of the people who own them to do that. We wrote at the end of a press release once, it was a response to the Daily Mail. They were writing a story about people carrying plastic bottles or something. And we wrote at the end of this press release, if Extinction Rebellion and the Daily Mail join forces, we could change the world. And and I think it's true. Yeah. And they, it's a shame that if they'd have taken, <laughs> if they'd have taken <laughs> us up on it, we could be in a really different place now. Yeah. Last week, there was a, a very short two inch column in the Times that was squeezed into such a small space. But it was a, a story of 13 million people facing hunger from droughts in Kenya and surrounding countries. And I just wonder, the journalist who wrote that, 
were they trying to put those kinds of stories into the newspaper, but then the editor just saying, no, you've only got two inches, sorry. It's currency, isn't it? There's probably been an announcement by an international agency. I mean, presumably the drought in the Horn of Africa has been going on for some time now, but something's triggered a news story about that. Someone's made a report or someone's made a very robust statement or something that's that's made it be news. But there's probably all sorts of competing priorities, like someone's been sacked or or there's another party or something that feels more immediate and more current. And so that story has been downgraded to a down page on, on 11 or something. Going back to trying to channel white, white band man's sensibilities and, and thinking that's, that's our audience, or even Middle England's sensibilities, that horrible cliche about two dead in Basildon are worth a thousand dead in Karachi is still a thing. There's a parochialism about British newspapers where the thing that's happening at home is always going to be 20 times more important than the thing happening over there somewhere problem with the climate crisis it's still to some extent in the eyes of news desks i suspect happening over there somewhere we haven't had our heat dome moment or anything here yet there's a cynical bit of me that thinks that that's what the news agenda will require over here is some massive cataclysmic moment that can be clearly pinned on climate change and happens on our doorstep that could be a tipping point but on a more general level i suspect as well that nib on page 27 in the in the times and the bit we don't often think about is the changes in newsrooms since I work there. The staffing levels are now so low and the reliance upon input from press releases is so high that it could be just as simple as Oxfam or somebody put out a press release at the same time the chief sub put his hand up when we got a space on page 27 where the foreign news usually goes, oh, look, Oxfam sent us a press release. These young journalists now are asked to multitask in a way I never was as a print journalist. I wrote print stories. They often have to multitask across online. They're constantly looking for fodder to shovel in. And that's where we get into this kind of nefarious ecosystem that exists between Tufton Street style think tanks and the lobbying groups and the big PR agencies attached to the government. They understand this dynamic. And they know that this is a machine that needs feeding. There's still as many pages, just not as many journalists. So if they can come out with their convincing, eye-catching reports that also tap into neoliberal right-wing news agenda in the newsroom, they know they're going to get space for it. Whereas something happening over there somewhere that's come in from an Oxfam thing is always going to end up on page 27. And I think that probably is an element with climate coverage as well. To be fair to journalists, probably most of them don't fully appreciate the gravity of the situation. They don't tend to be scientists, so they don't tend to understand the science, the government's not taking it seriously. You know, there are all sorts of reasons we're all as human beings tend towards denial. The focus on temperature targets in the future has not helped. So we're always talking about 1.5 degrees. Well, what does that mean to people? What we're talking about is the point at which the coral reefs all die and the oceans stop being a carbon sink. But but actually talking about 1.5 and 2 degrees feels quite abstracted. And then when you say by the end of the century or even by 2050, it's too far away. So people have this idea that it's something that they should care about because it's in the it's geographically distant or they should care about because it's temporally distant and it's going to affect their children, and their grandchildren. How do we help people to realise it's now and it's here? And even that the projections are very conservative, the danger of tipping points could mean that while we're trying to decarbonise by 2050 within the next seven or eight years, some tipping point could come along that just escalates everything. Talking in this rather abstract way it hasn't been helpful and we need to start talking in different ways. I asked a Guardian journalist a year or so ago, which is more of a priority in terms of writing an article? Was it to educate or to entertain? And she said both. But then there are many examples where entertaining articles are written with no educational merit, but there is a total absence of stories that educate without entertaining. So I wonder how responsible is the press to educate the public on climate and ecological emergency? 
it goes beyond the responsibility of being a journalist or of being an editor. It's about the responsibility of being a human being at a make or break moment for the human race. Where's your loyalty? Is it to your employer or is it to your planet? You don't have to leave your humanity at home when you go into the office. And in fact, you can't. And it should be the right of everybody, if not the duty, to share information that the rest of the world needs to know if it's helping take us over the cliff. Climate change is locked in. We can't escape climate change. It's not about stopping climate change. It's about stopping the worst excesses of it. It's about trying to prevent the, the tipping points, total climate breakdown. It's trying to make sure that there is a just transition out of fossil fuels. I think huge numbers of journalists, I mean, certainly ones that I speak to are massively conflicted about this, about working in newsrooms where they're under pressure to come up with a human interest angle on every story. And if there isn't a human interest angle, it's not really a story. And I think that kind of touches on what Zoe was saying there, which is that the it's very difficult, that dry report-based story is never going to be as good as the story about something happening to a person. Do they have a responsibility? Personally, the newspapers I work for, I, I think they are, uh, they are largely amoral. They're business driven. They don't feel that they have a, a responsibility to educate. There is no BBC style feeling that there's a, res there's, there's a responsibility for them as an organisation to educate. Entertain is their default position because entertain gets them readership and readership gets, at least in the old days before, Google and the online tech bros did for them, got them advertising. Certainly the sun end of it and the mirror end of it was built upon eyeballs and sales and, and entertainment. God, it feels like looking back to the days of the dinosaurs now, but TV took away their ability to be first to the news. So if you can't, if it's very difficult to break a story, what you do then, then you have to be more entertaining. You become a source of entertainment for people and entertainment worked. And when the sun reinvented itself as this kind of geezery newspaper that was primarily about entertainment and topless girls on page three and started selling three and four million copies a day. Everybody thought, way ha, this is the way to go. That was the way they went. Any sense that there was a responsibility to educate, I think, went then. And because print journalism is struggling to stay alive, its advertising revenue has, has dropped off a cliff. It's been fighting to see if it can use paywalls as, as ways of, of earning money. They're in survival mode, really. And, and responsibility went out the window with survival mode. So, that, you know, it's about how many, how many copies can I sell? It, it was interesting that the reporter also mentioned the BBC and to say, well, that's the BBC's job to educate the public. But then <laughs> I don't see that coming from the BBC. You know, I, um, no. the more I, I've learned about it, the more I notice the absence of what is needed from the BBC. I agree. I, I think the BBC are, I, I felt a massive pang of empathy with Zoe early when she talked about wanting to throw the radio at the wall. Um, and and I, I, I actually cannot listen to BBC news output anymore unless I'm asked to. If somebody says to me, can you listen to this thing that's on tonight, I will listen to it. For years, I had Radio 4 as the background to my day. And I never, ever listen to Radio 4 now because it makes me too angry. Um, it makes me too sad and too angry to listen to their output. And there's also something that I've come to see as the kind of the BBC chuckle. And it's a kind of thing that they all do where it's, you know, we could talk about the climate at the end of the world, but we're urbane, sensible, metropolitan people. We don't need to get obsessed with this silly earnestness, do we? Now, what's Pretty Patel's dress colour today? That kind of BBC chuckle, it drives me nuts. I think the BBC is a massive letdown for the entire country. It saddens me to say it because it, it gives ammo to really unpleasant politicians and business people who want to get rid of the BBC because it is a public service broadcaster. But I find it very, very difficult to defend the BBC's new, news output, even to myself. When I listen to the BBC, I think I'm being told everything I need to know. At least that's what I used to think. And I think a lot of uh, the public probably feel that way until I saw huge protest in London and I looked at the BBC News London and it was all football. Hmm. And I thought, you're not telling me what I need to know. You know, you're, you're omitting stuff, which is very important to me. And if I didn't see that firsthand, if I wasn't, if I didn't happen to be living in London, I wouldn't know about that. And it's almost as though people need to experience that letdown to suddenly have those rose-tinted glasses removed 
and to see actually that the BBC's news reporting is just very select amount, which has cut out so many important stories. Zoe, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, well, I just wanted to support what Steve said about tone of voice. There are certain science programmes on the BBC that do report on the crisis, but it's often done with this sort of rather flippant, cheerful tone of voice, which says we're telling you something incredibly serious, but we're going to make a slight sort of joke about it because we don't want anybody to feel too uncomfortable. I would take a bet with one of those presenters and producers on the Today programme that if you gave me a copy of the Daily Mail and the Daily Telegraph, I could write their morning news agenda for them. I wouldn't have to see what their news agenda was. I could write what the news agenda for the Today programme would be if I looked at the main story in the Mail and the Daily Telegraph. That's where the influence part comes in. Because as you quite rightly say, I still think the BBC is seen as an impartial purveyor of the truth by the man on the street. But the BBC's news agenda is hugely shaped by those right-wing newspapers. Um, And that's where the influence part comes from. I mean, you know, millions of people still read them. There's an older generation that still read newspapers. But, you know, anybody under 40, I think, probably these days isn't a newspaper buyer or reader, certainly under 30. The older generation still vote, don't they? Notoriously, millennials don't vote. Boomers and Gen Xers like me do. We read newspapers and Lots of people I went to school with, I bump into now, they basically vomit the Daily Mail's headlines at when I talk to them about anything to do with the world. So there's that influence, and there's the influence on the BBC's news agenda, on the BBC as a trusted, impartial purveyor of news. And I would add to that, we know from a recent documentary that the BBC did, which would have been legal to Kingdom Come, that Murdoch has an incredible political influence. Do you think that XR might just like getting in the papers? When we do an action, the point of doing an action is not that we want to get publicity about Extinction Rebellion. We're not trying to sell biscuits or cars. That's not why we do it. We do an action so that that gives journalists an excuse to write about the important stuff. We do an action and they come along and they want to write about the action. And we're saying, no, 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 we just want to get out of the way now. We're just giving you that event that you need to make something that you don't think of as news, news. So if we do something at Shell, write a big piece about Shell and the role of Shell in the climate crisis and how it's covered up what it knew about the clauses of of global warming 30 years ago. Don't focus on us and who we are and are we crusties. And when you're writing out about Insulate Britain, Talk about the fact that the housing stock in Britain is the leakiest in the whole of Europe and that the government's just wasted two and a half billion on PPE that couldn't be used, that could have been spent on social housing, insulating them. Write about that, but they don't. They write about our protests. The next rebellion comes along. We do actions and we try and get journalists along to write about the climate crisis. And they say it hasn't scaled. You haven't got any more people than last time. But this is just like the action that you did last time. But there is this pressure from the media for us to escalate. The next thing will be, oh, but you're alienating the public because you've escalated. So they push us into this bind. Journalists have a responsibility now, but we are asking of them a level of career-ending bravery to try and exercise that responsibility within the environments that they work. That's what we're asking of them. I genuinely think lots of these journalists, they completely get it. They completely get why we're doing the actions. They completely get that we're the action is pointing at something and that they should then write about the thing. But going back to what I said previously, they, they are not allowed to write about the thing because that's not what their news desk or their owners want them to write about. They want to launch ad hominem attacks on Extinction Rebellion and insulate Britain because that's a way of distracting from the very thing they don't want to write about. I had a couple of tabloid journalists write some of the stories for Not The Sun. This solved their conscience a little bit. It was great to be able to write a story from the truthful point of view, you know? As Zoe says, to write about a thing and say, here's the event, dear boy, but the event points to this bigger story. I think us expecting them to be able to do with it with their organisations might be almost impossible for them to do. I think what we need to do is support them to find other outlets for their energies and to divorce themselves from those organisations in the end. I think what we should be doing is empowering 
these young journalists to do what they need to do outside of the conventional mainstream media because as Steve says you know all the journalists that we come across that are never going to shift their attitude in terms of tipping points if these younger journalists realize that there are other younger journalists like them feeling the same way if we can in some way connect them and create some sense of solidarity and empower them maybe then things will start to shift i mean what if all the young journalists on the mail online just didn't go to work one day yeah a kind of war story on the sun a kind of rite of initiation in the sun newsroom as a young journalist you've just been hired on staff as you walked in the the news editor would say could you have a quiet word and you'd be walked around the corner and then slammed up against the wall and told you work for him now you told him everything first and if you didn't he would get you I kind of hope after 20 odd years that that's not the case now. The phone hacking scandal and so on has actually brought a kind of modicum of modern management in there. They're influence peddlers and they know that they have the dirt on people. You know, the Sun firmly believes it wins, still believes now, and, and the Mail to some extent that they win and lose elections for political parties. And enough politicians in this country still believe that to be true. My experiences at the Sun... You know, whether this thing actually existed as a, as a physical object, I don't know. But there was a le- legendarily, there was a thing that people refer to as the sun safe. And the sun safe was where they kept all the stories that they knew about people that they weren't going to print unless the person didn't cooperate in other ways. So if you ever read a newspaper and thought, why the hell would that A-list celebrity talk to the sun about their marriage breakup? Why would they do that? Because somebody has phoned them and said, do you you want to talk to us about your marriage breakup or would you like to to print this story instead? I was part of the group that blocked the newsprint place in Broxbourne. We found out through the first sets of court cases that Priti Patel phoned the chief constable of Hertfordshire to tell him that the action was happening before his own men. And that very, very strongly suggests that she was called by somebody at News International directly. The first call to the chief constable was to tell him that this thing was happening and to tell him that he had to expedite by whatever means, the removal of these protesters from the road outside of Rupert Murdoch's plant plant. And then when you think about it, the Home Secretary would be what, second or third most powerful person in our government? Priti Patel stayed up all night phoning that Chief Constable. She was calling him on the hour, every hour, until 6 a.m. from 11 a.m. the night before. So somebody got Priti Patel out of bed and then made her sit up all night to have people removed from a print plant. Why would Priti Patel do that? Because Priti Patel and Boris Johnson were the only people at Rupert Murdoch's wedding, the only politicians at the wedding, and they are reported to be very close to Rupert Murdoch. And Rupert Murdoch has supported their candidacies for high office and not reported things that could have finished their careers off. You know, Johnson's right wing populism has for a while been great for. Rupert Murdoch, Priti Patel's quite frankly frothing authoritarianist streak and wish to bring in punitive legislation is also great for him. This is a woman who sat up all night to try and get rid of 52 protesters outside of his plant and who's now pushing through a policing bill that wouldn't be out of place in an authoritarian dictatorship. There's a clause making a newspaper printing plant part of vital national infrastructure for which you could face 10 years in prison for disrupting. We can suppose from this that these people are both being coached into positions of power and possibly have stuff held over them as well. If you'd like to hear more from people who've reached their tipping point and became environmental activists, earlier on in the series I spoke with a vicar, a pilot, Olympic athletes, a police officer, and Robert Llewellyn off the telly. Now back to Zoe and Steve. How was your mental health affected by learning about our futures and how little care there is to preserve them? It hasn't been a straightforward three years since I got involved with XR, put it that way. You find yourself living in a different reality to most of the people around you. When I'm with XR people, we come from a baseline of understanding of what's happening in the world. When I'm with people who aren't either in XR or fully engaged, there's 
a baseline understanding of how the world works that's different and out of whack. And that can be quite stressful at times, having to be careful about what you say or how you say it or how much you say it. It feels like you're challenging them in some way. When Don't Look Up came out, it was like a great catharsis for so many of us. I mean, we're not the scientists having the meetings at the White House, but I'm talking to journalists all the time and talking to friends and having my reality just being dismissed. So I think for a lot of us, Don't Look Up just felt like, finally, somebody is actually describing what it feels like to be the Cassandras in society. Yeah. And, and what drove Cassandra mad was not that she could see the future, it was that nobody listened to what she had to say. Yeah, and I completely felt that sense of catharsis watching that and the Cassandra thing of thinking, oh my God, somebody's finally nailed that. That feeling of being in a room where you can see everybody looking at you going, yeah, 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 don't believe you. Um, uh, was, was so well put and has actually started conversations with people. The kind of media image that, uh, that actually summed up my experiences for me really was that interview with George Monbiot where he burst into tears and the reaction of the anchor creature and the, the, his kind of adversary that he'd been set up against wasn't, oh my God, George must see something. Re- if George, something like George sees something like that, it must be really awful. It was, poor George, he's having a mental breakdown. He, he's, uh, unfortunately, you know, this stuff he's doing has, has found some terrible chink in George's character and, and, and mental setup. And, and George is falling apart. We must feel a little sorry for George and perhaps offer George some mental health and support. And that's the, that, I think that's one of the difficult things about mental health and dealing with this and accepting, as Zoe said right at the beginning, okay, rationally, I get this. And then one day, maybe not one day, but slowly you realise emotionally you've accepted it as well, is in here all the time. And then seeing people around you treat that as a pathology, as almost a form of mental illness that you need help with, is a really difficult one. Perhaps the most difficult one, I think. So have you experienced something similar? It's more that I have to moderate how far I talk about it and how far I don't in my social circle. I try and be a bit annoying, but not too annoying. (laughs) How has your life changed since joining Extinction Rebellion? I found myself living a dual existence since I got involved. I have a great feeling of hope and optimism. And that buoys me along 99% of the time. As I said, finding yourself not alone even my closest family. I, I have no relationship with my youngest brother now because he's a fully paid up Daily Mail reading Thatcherite semi-denier who thinks I've been sucked into a cult. Seeing people go, yeah, 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 I get it. I'm not doing anything. Actually, don't really want to hear it anymore. Not going to do anything. Going to keep flying. Going to keep driving a car. Not going to get involved with Extinction Rebellion either because got other stuff going on. You know, busy life, busy job. Just can't be doing it. But there's also the feeling of coming home about having found your people, I think, within XR. I found incredibly empowering and helpful for my mental health. Even in your worst moments, there are people to go and have a cry with who go, don't worry, this isn't, this isn't mental illness. This is a perfectly rational response to this shit. <laughs> At its best, there are incredibly transformative moments of thinking we, we're making a real difference here. We're changing conversations and we, we could just win this. I know from talking to people in the court cases, I've spent the last three years following the court cases, doing the media, and and a lot of that has been talking to people who've been arrested and are going through the court system. And I talk to them about why they got involved and their motivation. And a lot of them have been involved with conventional campaigning for years, if not decades, and have felt this growing sense of frustration of feeling like you're doing stuff, but that it's not having any effect at all. And most of them, if not all of them, feel a sense of transformative empowerment by having taken part in an XR action. I wonder if people who have made those choices to just go into some level of activism that may write off their friends, might write off their family, and they have to make a choice about whether they maintain their community and their sense of togetherness with their friends and family, or they make a difference to the fate of humanity and civilization. Uh, I wonder if in your experiences with people in court cases, if they've experienced that. Some of them will talk about that 
feeling of being at odds with their family and doing this despite the fact that their family think they're bonkers or they don't approve of it or they dislike it. It seems to me from having watched a lot of these court cases and these hearings is a sense of moral certainty that even though the law might be saying they're guilty, they know that they are doing the right thing, that if there's any issue of guilt, it's the guilt of having stood around for years, that the guilt will be in however many years' time when people turn around and say, well, why didn't you do more? What, what all you did was sit in the road? Why didn't you do more? That's what people are going through and thinking about and cogitating when they're going through the court cases. One of the things that we talk about is freedom and care. The right will talk about freedom. They want to take away your freedom to fly and your freedom to drive a car and your freedom to do this. And we say freedom isn't just about the freedom to consume. There's something else going on there that actually it can be a prison being caught in this trap of to work more, to accumulate more, to spend more. And actually there's a freedom that comes with just stepping off that. It isn't all about giving up and loss, that actually there's a lot to be gained. And a lot of that is freedom from a pretty toxic system. When we do this work, it really feels like it matters. There were many years where it was hard to find freelance work in journalism and it felt like a real people would say to me well maybe you need to find something else to do and it felt like a sense of grief like my identity is being a journalist and I'm going to have to give this up I feel far less compromised doing the work that I do now than I think a lot of the journalists I deal with are. Steve uh, how old are your children now? Um, my daughter's 18 and my son's 15. How responsible do you feel about the actions you're taking in the way that your children see it? And do your children feel like a sense of responsibility to act as well? I feel a massive sense of responsibility. A kind of little anecdote came to mind as Zoe was saying that, and as you were talking about people in courts. After the newsprint action, after I was arrested, I was held for quite a long time, and I got home in the early hours of the morning. My son was waiting for me, and he was worried and upset because Dad had spent a day in a prison cell. And what I'd done was disrupt the very people I used to work for, you know. He, so he was like, why did you do that, Dad? And, you know, I was scared and you were in a cell and why did you do that? And, and I said to him, well, well, it's like this. In about 20 years' time, when whatever happens, happens here, one way or the other, I will be able to look you in the eye and say, I did everything I could to stop it. And, and that's that. I think that's probably where we, we come from on these things. You know, I, I, I can't be the person who he looks at and says, when you knew, Dad, what did you do? It was one of those moments when I really felt I connected with him. And it, I, I like to think that'd be one of those things that will stick with him over the years. And with my daughter as well, you know, that it will be a thing that they will perhaps take strength from in whatever times lie ahead and, and, and that they will build their own sense of activism out of that. It's been a fascinating chat and both of you are working so hard and doing so really great work. And with that, thank you both for your fascinating insights. Thank you. Thank you. Before I sign off, I'd like to squeeze in Steve's story about making that one-off newspaper called Not The Sun to show that a national tabloid could be as entertaining as well as telling the truth about the climate crisis. You could have a good tabloid. A tabloid format isn't evil by its by nature. It's evil by the way it's used. The chance to actually put something together that showed that. I found a group of Extinction Rebellion people who had some design skills, uh, very talented designers and sub-editors and, 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 and writers, and also people that I knew within tabloids who I knew were desperate for some other outlet for their writing skills. I got quite a small group of people together and we sat down and we designed a template. What would a news agenda be like if we actually were beyond politics? There isn't a political party here that can't rescue us. So we're not going to be having a go at Murdoch because we, we hate Boris Johnson, because we support Corbyn or Keir Starmer. We're having a go because the whole system needs lampooning. We set out to use, you know, alliterative headlines and uh, very short stories and puns and subversions of things like the page three. I, I don't know if you ever saw the newspaper. We had um, Boris Johnson and Keir Starmer in mankinis as, uh, as the page three lovelies. And 
the idea was this wasn't to be a parody. This was to show that you could actually use something like the Sun to have a very different worldview, but also that those mainstays of the newspaper can be written really entertainingly, you know, with lots of puns, amusing stuff in them, but that they can cover the world from a different perspective. They can actually say, here's how to have an aspirational lifestyle that doesn't involve buying a car. Hey, that super sore away sun holiday you wanted to go on, you can still go on it. You don't fly to it though. And, you know, here's why. And, you know, the sports section of the sun, what does it mean if the sports section of the sun takes the climate crisis on board? It was a huge amount of fun. It was quite high pressure as well, because like lots of things next to a small group of people delivered an awful lot. The thing I really enjoyed about it, the printing and distribution part of it, because the thing you find with XR, people come out of the woodwork who've got unexpected skills, you know, guys who, who know how to work out a distribution network really quickly, people who know what how to set up printing deals and find a good printer. That all kind of happened and slotted into place. And then it's obviously much more cost effective and easier to do an online thing. We managed to distribute 10,000 copies of a newspaper during the rush hour in 23 towns and cities across the country. There was a funny cock-up story, which we actually turned into a positive. The wrong picture of somebody went in. And not only is the wrong picture of somebody went in, it's the wrong Barclay. So we did the press barons. We got the 10,000 copies. They're going, to, they're going to go out to be distributed. And it's a picture of Patrick Barclay, Times sports journalist, rather than Frederick Barclay, billionaire owner. This is one of the things I love about Extinction Rebellion, and, and particularly people in Extinction Rebellion. I was like mortified, like, oh, God almighty, we're going to have to pulp it. I phoned the lawyers, and they're like, oh, my God, mate, that's, that's so libelous, you have to pulp it. I phoned Ali Rowe, who is always brilliant in situations like this, and Ali Rowe was like, no, mate, that's bloody funny. We're going to phone Patrick Barkley. And that's what we did. We phoned Patrick Barkley, and Patrick, mate, you're down as a climate-denying billionaire in the copy of Not the Sun. And he was like, that is the funniest thing I've heard for a very long time. Can you send me a copy now? So we sent him a copy and he was like, that's hilarious. I'll write you a letter now saying I don't care. A bunch of us sat up for half the night and you know, there was no screaming, shouting. And nobody got fired. People sat down and went, OK, that's actually quite funny. What should we do about it? And then Ali went, how about if we just blot out his picture? So we sat up all night with super sticky labels and stuck them on 10,000 copies of the sun over his guy's face. What we also did, which I loved, and again, was about this honesty and truthfulness, was that the press release acknowledged that we'd done this thing. Hey, we made a, we made a cock up, but it was five of us in the back room, you know, sitting around a kitchen table. We made a national newspaper, made a bit of a screw up in it, but we put it right. And here's what Patrick Barkley says about it. And we used a quote from him. We showed proof of concept. You can produce a national newspaper with five of you uh, that's funny and accessible and tells the story that you need telling. I'd like us to go on now and, and, and do that on a, on, a, on a more regular basis. Music from Climate by Eric Ian Walker. Commissioned by the Climate Music Project. We communicate the sense of urgency of the climate and ecological crises through the emotional power of music. More to be found at ericianwalker.bandcamp.com and climatemusic.org.